All right, Bishop Strickland, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, happy feast day of St. Nathaniel. Uh, you know, it's a, a beautiful day, and uh, we, uh, we're we going to talk here in a moment about your that beautiful pastoral letter that you uh, that you delivered to the Diocese of Tyler, and you know it's it's been making its way around. People are are really reacting. Uh, I've seen just so many positive and beautiful comments about it, and you know your fatherly wisdom and you know your spiritual protection. So thank you for that. But before we kind of dive in and we'll we'll unpack the letter a little bit and and kind of talk about that, can you, uh, of course, as you always do, would you uh, be so kind as to lead us in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we thank you for this day, for the great apostle that we celebrate, St. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, one of the twelve, and one who, like most of them, gave his life as a martyr. May we be inspired by the saints and the martyrs who lived for you, and many died for you, and Remember the, the grace and the blessing that they lived, even in the midst of suffering and challenges. We ask your blessing for us and for all those who will eventually listen to our conversation. May the saints intercede for us, especially the Queen of Saints, the Immaculate Virgin Mary. And we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, like I said, and... Uh... Uh, folks by now will probably have seen on on their favorite Catholic news channels that you have issued a uh, a letter, a paternal letter to uh, the faithful in the Diocese of Tyler. And, um, you know, you talk about, uh, among other things, you, you, you talk about the, the synod and synodality that's coming up and, and some of the things that are going to be um, uh, potentially discussed. And so, um, you know, you, you got out in front of that just to kind of clarify. So, uh, you know, why did you feel the need to be proactive rather than reactive in terms of what may be coming down the pipeline from the Synod? Well, really, Paul, I imagine people that are deeply committed to their Catholic faith. Uh, all of us have read a lot and heard comments from cardinals and priests and and some bishops, and a lot of commentaries. And there just seem to be a lot of issues. Uh, the instrument of laboris is, is fairly general, but there are some clearly laid out uh, issues that, that I had a concern about. And frankly, Paul, I, I think I heard from enough people, it just reached a point where I felt like I needed to, to speak. I needed to, for the diocese, um, I travel the diocese all the time. I go to other places as well, but most evenings I'm out in, especially in this part time of the year, celebrating a confirmation or some other event. And I just hear from the people and certainly they email and, and contact me in other ways, but just a lot of questions. And I felt the need to, to be very clear and really go back to what I tried to, to uh, address in this letter, those seven points especially, are things that we believe that aren't changing, that um, are part of the, the deposit of faith, part of the foundation of, of who we are. That's really why I wanted to start with knowing Jesus Christ. And when you really know him, and when you believe he's present in the church, in the sacraments, especially in the Eucharist, then there's some things that just flow out of that reality of knowing Jesus Christ, knowing his bride, the church, and knowing who we are. So I tried to make those seven points of, of things that, you know, to me, sadly, are controversial in the world, for sure, and too controversial where there shouldn't really be any controversy in the church. I believe all those seven points are just part of our faith. And there there really is no controversy. Um, I guess I would be more comfortable if the Senate had a tone of, let's find better ways to explain these truths, rather than let's discuss them and see if we want to change anything. Um, that, to me, is, in general, uh, the tone that I hear 
from the instrument of Laboris and from just the Senate in general. And, and, and even backing up, I mean, I, honestly, you asked me what prompted me to write this letter. I think it was concern about this. I mean, here we are coming toward the end of August. So it's about a month. Um, I'm not sure exactly what date the Senate begins in October, but you know, life moves quickly. Families are back in school. Um, I just thought it was time to to speak up and to, you know, alert people to concerns that I have as their spiritual father. No, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's incumbent upon you to do so, uh, I think, um, you know, as our as our shepherd and as our father to um, help lead us. And that 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 kind of segues to my next question. And you uh, in the letter, you quote St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And, you know, in his letters, he doesn't shy away from times from admonishing the faithful, but he does it in love. Right. He's he's it's so clear that he loves his flock and he wants what's best for them. So it's not just a matter of hellfire and brimstone or whatever, but it's 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 really so that they will enjoy eternal life. Can you speak to that spirit of St. Paul's loving admonishment? to not accept an alternative gospel. Absolutely. <laughs> he, uh, he makes it clear that Jesus Christ has given, a, he's revealed the fullness of truth. And I mean, this is first century, of course, when Paul is writing. And already, you know, I mean, even as Christianity is being established, there are people fighting against it, rejecting it. I mean, the same real circumstances we have in the 21st century. So I think what that quotation really gets at is we know this to be true. It's not going to change. Even an angel can come down and say, oh, this is changing. No, it's not going to change. And I think that whole tone of looking at some major points of faith and saying, well, we may change this. We have a, a new gospel or the spirit has moved us in a different direction. Paul is saying that's not going to happen. So be alert when you see it happening and say, no, not. I mean, he says in the letter, basically, even if it's Paul saying, oh, we found something new. We found something that changes all this. Reject it because he knew. And to me, Paul, <laughs> that is what it comes down to. Paul, the evangelist and apostle, knew Jesus Christ. He didn't walk with him the way the, the 12 did, but he knew him intimately with that encounter on the road to Damascus. And, and frankly, the two of us, Paul and Joe, we're just men who know Jesus Christ. And if you really know him, and if you know he is truth incarnate, that's what I hear Paul saying is that, you know, it's not going to change ever. It's eternal truth. And I mean, he uses, as you say, it's a loving tone, but love sometimes needs to be very clear and even could be judged to be harsh. Um, but he says, let them be accursed if they try to bring uh, uh, in the idea that a new gospel, a, a change of this truth. And that's, to be a curse, that's a pretty strong word. But I think it shows the passion of Paul. And it's the same passion that we need to have for the truth that Christ has lived, died, and risen to share with us. So, you know, that brings up this next question, and it's about the, the seven teachings you write about that the church has always held. Um, and, you know, like you like you said, you know, it's shocking that we live in a day where those are somehow controversial or, you know, saying soon maybe, you know, and not just with the world, but even within the church. You know, what's your advice for how the faithful can stand firm upon the gospel truths that we've always known to be true? Well, really, Paul, I'm asked that question fairly often, <laughs> and I guess I've developed sort of my standard answer, and it it probably sounds too simple in some ways, but what I would encourage people, if on any of those seven points, and there's lots of confusion, there's lots of different ideas, certainly outside the church. I mean, 
much of the world would absolutely reject all seven and say, oh, that's, we don't believe this. It's not, not the truth that guides us. Mm -hmm. But even within the church, there it's like things are sort of up for debate. Um, and what I encourage, I mean, it's just come from my own prayer life and my own work as a bishop, very imperfect, very sinful, finding my own sinfulness and weakness and not claiming to have anything but the truth of Christ. But really, my recommendation is when you come into murky territory, where even as disciples and truly committed to the church and to the gospel, you know, things can come along and it's like, well, I'm really not so sure. Go back to Christ. Go back to his words. Go back to his actions. Go back to go back to the gospels and just Look to him. How did Jesus deal with something that is approaching this? I mean, just for example, um, the beautiful story of Jesus, the woman at the well. This woman was far from his. I mean, she was a Samaritan. She was far from his tradition, from the world that Jesus grew up in. And so it's a beautiful image of what does Jesus do? When it's a person from out there in, in a totally different universe from what you're accustomed to, you approach them with kindness and respect, and but you bring the challenge of the truth. What does he tell that woman finally? Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He says that over and over again. And Jesus, that is what the the woman at the well or the woman called in adultery all the the i guess simply to say paul what's my recommendation look to jesus look at what he actually says in the gospel like you know that question on universalism it's like well you know i'm not sure about this and certainly we all love to think well you don't have to do much everybody's going to go to heaven but if you look at, well, what did Jesus actually say? He says it's a narrow path. He, meant, he uses that, I mean, the the camel going through the eye of a needle. I mean, it, he uses a lot of different images in different parts of the gospel to tell us it's a challenge. But he ends with the greatest message of hope we could have. All things are possible with God. So that answers a lot of questions. I mean, whatever we're dealing with that we're not so sure about, my recommendation, and certainly read the scriptures, read the gospel specifically. Mm -hmm. But when I say go to Jesus, I mean literally as well. I mean, what nurtures my life is Eucharistic adoration. If we believe he's really there, which we do, we know he's really there, then when, I mean, literally, for parents or people that are watching this and you're struggling and you're not sure, go spend some time with Jesus. And no, I'm not, I mean, miraculously, sometimes people do have a, a moment when he speaks to them. And maybe people will have that. I've never had that as far as an actual voice. I've, I've felt his truth really come clear in my heart. And I think that's what most of us experience. But I would say a great um, combination kind of go and read a gospel passage that somehow speaks to maybe what you're confused about with in his presence in front of, I mean, certainly at a tabernacle if possible, if, but if at all possible um, in Eucharistic adoration, because that to me, we speak of his Eucharistic face and it. It just helps me. I'm just sharing what helps me to to go back to say, Lord, I know you're here. I know you are loving me and you are hearing me. I'm not hearing you in, in that human way, but he does speak to us. And Paul, I can tell you a lot of the things people will say, oh, Bishop, I loved what you said here. And it's like, honestly, I can look at it and say, I'm not sure where that came from, but it comes from being with the Lord and living in his word. So my next question, it kind of deals with, I think, in a sense, the, the concept of repentance and something that I've been kind of ruminating on is like there's this 
this dichotomy between Christ calls us to repent and change our lives, to be in conformity with God so that grace can flow and we can share in his eternal life. That's that's one option. The other option is the world is calling on the church to repent so that it can become more worldly. And so, you know, you mention in the letter the term schism. And, you know, that's like, that's a, a word that has been used, you know, it's it's kind of bubbled up in, you know, in the last several years, schism gets kind of put out there, um, I think, to kind of frighten people, quite frankly. You know, they're kind of frightened, like, oh, I, I want to be in schism. You know, can you dispel the false narrative that people who wish to remain upon the plumb line of Catholic orthodoxy are somehow schismatic? Well, uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, and what occurs to me, Paul, is the the whole idea of the what is schism? It's separating from the truth. It's saying, I no longer believe this truth. Um, and certainly, it, it's a term that as I understand it, and I'm no expert on schism, but um, it it technically deals with separating from the truth that the bride of Christ proclaims, that we we believe in the church, the Catholic church, the Roman Catholic church established by Christ, and schism is to, to separate from that leadership, from that um, teaching of the truth. Uh, but I think that what, what we're facing is recognizing that ultimately to be schismatic is to separate from the truth that is Jesus Christ. Um, I, again, I go back to, as I said, go to him in prayer into his real presence. But I think for the question of, you know, how do we navigate everything with the church that's going on with the whole question of schism is to go back to Christ. Again, what did he say? What has the church, how has the church understood what Christ said through all of these centuries and to, and to keep going back to that? Um, I think that the, the deposit of faith is one way of expressing, you know, people ask me, Bishop, what is the deposit of faith? Well, it's sacred scripture, it's tradition, it's the hierarchical teachings of the church, mainly in encyclicals and other documents through the ages. The catechism sort of captures all that. All of those are elements of the deposit of faith. Um, but I, I guess a, a good answer, you know, I know I'm sort of being redundant, but the reality is Jesus Christ <laughs> is the living incarnation of the deposit of faith we always look to him and anything that begins to be out of sync with with what his bride the church has said through the ages that's where i think we need to to really be cautious and to really ask ourselves um you talk about the and that, and i think that is part of the the tone of things the world doesn't need to change the church needs to change and adapt more fully to the world. Um, I believe we do need to recognize that the language we use, how we present this timeless truth can always, I mean, from the human perspective, we can always do a better job of with love and with charity, which is love, with clarity to, to share the truth that is Jesus Christ. We can always find better ways. We're going to find those, I believe, the more we look to Christ. I mean, he gave us great tools for how do we do this with one-on-one -on -one conversations, with always respect, but always with great clarity. Jesus doesn't mince words. He doesn't compromise the way all of us tend to. So I think with the, all the concerns about schism, um, to know Jesus Christ, to know him more and more deeply is the best way we can be clear that we aren't going to, I mean, it's not just something you just wake up, oops, I fell into schism. I mean, it's a 
a clear decision to say, I reject this truth. Mm -hmm. And if we remember Jesus Christ is truth incarnate and always go back to him mm -hmm. and always call others back to him. I mean, that's one thing that I think we need to be reminded of is that individuals, I, we could go into a list of names that are controversial. I guess maybe mine is these days, but um, to, to not mention names, but to recognize God's loving call. And that's what I tried to say in this letter. God's loving call is universal for all people at all time. Mm -hmm. And for you and me as Joe and Paul, and for your beloved family and for the people I serve as a bishop, God's call is for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so the charitable thing to do is to find that person where they are, do find the tools to relate to them, but always bring them to Christ. And I think there's a tone in the world and even in the church sometimes it's just like, go out to them, but don't bring them to Christ. Just go out to them and you know, be there, I guess. Mm -hmm. But our mission, the church's mission is the salvation of souls. How do we do that? Through Jesus Christ. He's the savior of souls. And so as you look at what we've talked about, I talk about Jesus Christ a lot because he's the answer to it all yeah. and knowing him more deeply. And uh, to to look at, and I would, I guess I would conclude with the whole question of schism just keep turning to Jesus Christ and know that the whole existence of the church, the, the papacy, the Vatican, the episcopacy, the sacraments, the word of God, it's all focused on helping us know Jesus Christ more deeply. And it's the church that he's given us. So absolutely, we love and respect the church as she is. Mm -hmm. We don't leave, as the letter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Mm -hmm. Quoting St. Peter. And so if we bring that heart to the controversies, I would encourage anyone listening that, you know, is frightened of schism, you know, you're not going to have to worry about it if you your heart is always humbly seeking the truth of Christ. Beautifully said, beautifully said, you know, and, and God is love and you know, Jesus Christ is love and the greatest act of love that we have or that we are capable of as humans is to bring people to Jesus Christ. You know, the, 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 just logically, that's how that follows. Now, you end your letter, you know, with the message that Christ will not abandon his bride and people may be tempted to despair, you know, when reading the signs of the times um, and there's no shortage of that. Uh, but can you speak to the hope of victory we have in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Well, he's, he's promised he would be with us until the end of the age, that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And I think one way to, to be more comfortable with that is, is to learn some history. The church has gone through a lot. I mean, I think we're in, in one of the most unique times, if not the most unique with the controversies we're facing. But the church has gone through a lot. Read about the fourth century or third and fourth century with Arianism, or read about the year 1000 when St. Peter Damian was dealing with a lot of the same issues of sexual immorality in the church, in the clergy that we're dealing with now. Um, just no history and trust in, the, in what the Lord says. I think what history does is show us we see examples of it looked like the church was collapsing, like at the, the time of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Um, but then the Counter-Reformation happens and, you know, the church continues. The church, you know, I think we tend to measure the church in, because we're human, and in human worldly terms, mm -hmm. how many numbers, how much wealth, all these things. But I love the, the image, and, and to me, it helps with my understanding of what is Christ really saying when he says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Um, I like to think of the image of the church as the mystical body of Christ. And in that image, what when I think about the mystical body of Christ, that is you and me and billion other people, really, at least millions and millions of true believers that 
they we are the church and just look to the martyrs i mean they're individuals for which the gates of hell did not prevail the gates of hell may have taken them to death they, they were martyred but you look at the martyrs they were willing to die rather than for the church in their hearts to die and so i, I think as the mystical body of Christ, it's basically the same principle. And it, and I know that you and I would die for our faith. Hopefully, we're not called to that. But in a sense, we're all called to it every day, to die to the world and to live for Christ. That's what we're called to. So I think we can really be energized by the hope and the, the sure and certain hope that the church speaks of, that that Christ is with us, that he is Lord, that he's conquered sin and death, and that the challenge we have, which is a big challenge, and it's a daily challenge, but is to follow him more and more deeply, to turn from sin and to live the virtues more and more completely. Well, Your Excellency, I, I want to, because I have a, a somewhat unique ability to, uh, to you know, have these discussions with you. I want to, you know, take this moment to like thank you um, on behalf of of countless people out there. You know, this this pastoral letter it's it's a gift from a father to his children. You know, it's clear truth, but it's not legalistic or academic. It's not highfalutin like we might say here in Texas. Instead, it's approachable, it's straightforward, and it's really a message for all, and it's a message of love. It's it's clearly a love letter from a father to his children and a love letter to Jesus Christ and his church. So thank you so much for this gift. Thank you, Paul. Would you be so kind as uh, to, as we conclude, would you be so kind to close us out in prayer? Almighty God, we ask your blessing for Paul and his family and all who will listen to this recording, that it may give them an opportunity to grow closer to your son, to live more fully in his light, to know his blessings and love for them and all that they face each day. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you.